United Launch Alliance, a monopoly for years, was in serious trouble when it was disrupted by SpaceX. But now, this giant's on the road back to where it used to be. CEO Tory Bruno transformed the company to fight back from losing the Pentagon launch monopoly to SpaceX. He's developing a new rocket and has won a historic launch contract. But how exactly did Bruno revive ULA, and will it be enough? Let's find out in today's episode of Great SpaceX. ULA was born in an unlikely union in 2006 when the Pentagon allowed Lockheed Martin and Boeing to form a joint venture that gave the newly formed company, ULA, a monopoly on all military launch contracts. At the time, the Pentagon was focused on assured access to space, emphasizing reliable rockets that would fly successfully over cost. ULA essentially operated as an arm of the Pentagon while raking in billions of dollars. However, by 2014, ULA wasn't the rocket industry stalwart it had been since its founding almost a decade earlier when it had a monopoly on lucrative Pentagon contracts to lift national security satellites into orbit. Instead, the company was under intense pressure. Elon Musk and SpaceX were on the prowl, disrupting the industry and threatening to take a large chunk of ULA's government business. Congress was moving to ban the Russian-made engine the company used in its workhorse rocket. ULA's parent companies, Lockheed Martin and Boeing, were growing desperate, and there were fears that they might want to cut their losses and move on from the company. So, when Tory Bruno accepted the offer to lead the faltering company, which had recently ousted its CEO, he knew what he'd be getting into. It was clear they were in serious trouble. This is a company that wasn't supposed to survive. Now, about eight years later, after enduring what Bruno called a quest to completely transform the company, ULA, once in a downward spiral, is experiencing a remarkable transformation. Bruno now says he gave ULA a slim chance of surviving. In the darkest periods, he saw an opportunity to improve a company that had enjoyed a monopoly for years and had gotten complacent. Not having to compete, it extracted enormous sums from the Pentagon, which didn't flinch at the exorbitant prices as long as the company kept up its launch success. Now, it had to fight, and against the most innovative and disruptive forces ever to tear through the space business. SpaceX had won contracts to fly astronauts to the space station on its Falcon 9 rocket, and was showing that you could reuse the boosters instead of throwing them away, as had been done for years and was also developing another, even larger rocket, known as the Falcon Heavy. ULA had been the dominant player for so long, but now Bruno feared SpaceX was in a position to take over, potentially leaving the Pentagon where it was before with a single provider. Though he is well known and respected within the somewhat insular space community, Bruno has nothing near the celebrity cachet of Musk and Bezos. Still, he has enormous influence in a fast-growing industry and is regarded as an engineer's engineer. Thoughtful, calm, and deliberative. He moved to remake the company with the sole purpose of battling SpaceX. He laid off 30% of ULA staff and took steps to unite what he said were two companies. One that worked on the company's Atlas V, the other that worked on its Delta rockets with separate lines in the factory. And of course separate launch pads, he said. But also separate teams and separate management structures, and to a large extent, even separate accounts. It was a massive overhaul and he had to do it while maintaining ULA's successful launch record. Don't break mission success, he said. That was number one. He pitted suppliers against each other, making them compete and then giving each much more volume, but only if they would cut their prices. He also decided that the company couldn't just sit back while Musk and SpaceX gobbled it up. We had to take the fight to the competitors, Bruno said. You can't ignore the other guy and let the company do whatever they want and have an open playing field. He also knew he had to get ULA off the Russian-made RD-180 engine. There too, he pitted a pair of companies against each other and made them compete for the work. One was Aerojet Rocketdyne, the industry stalwart, an engine manufacturer with a long legacy in the space business. The other was Bezos' Blue Origin, a relative newcomer but had been working for years on a secret new engine. 
In 2018, Bruno selected Blue Origin over Aerojet Rocketdyne, but the deal has not worked out as well as he had hoped. Making a new rocket engine is difficult, and Bruno budgeted extra time into the schedule. I planned on the BE-4 being late because I knew it was ambitious for them, Bruno told reporters in April. I did not plan on them being this late. Publicly, Bruno has maintained a professional posture, saying he had confidence in the team at Blue Origin and that it would deliver. Privately, he was frustrated with the delays and pressured Blue to get the engine ready. Now, Bruno says delivery of the engine should happen this summer, and the first flight of the new Vulcan Centaur rocket would come later this year or early next. Not only would it have an American-made engine, but ULA plans to reuse them. Unlike SpaceX, which flies its rockets back to Earth so they can be reflown, ULA is still planning to drop the engines out of the rocket's first stage and catch them. Bruno also added, being able to reuse the engines would help drive down costs and compete with SpaceX. Since its inception, ULA has relied mostly on the government for revenue, flying missions for the Pentagon or NASA. But with more than 40 launches booked to fly Amazon's Kuiper satellite constellation to orbit, the company's flight rate is set to significantly increase. Typically, ULA flies about 10 missions a year. The Amazon deal would increase that flight rate to 20 to 25 flights and allow the company to hire several hundred more employees and the more often the rocket flies, the more efficient the company will become, he said, further reducing costs and allowing it to fight for more business. According to Bruno, Vulcan is much less expensive than the Atlas V that it currently flies. As the flight rate goes up, there's economies of scale, so it gets cheaper over time. And of course, you're introducing reusability, so it's cheaper. It's just getting more and more competitive. Of course, that's the theory. But with Starship, SpaceX could disrupt the market yet again and continue to dominate the industry. After all, as Matthew Weinzerl and Brandon Rosso, who teach a space economics course at Harvard Business School, said, ULA still faces and will continue to face significant challenges. Even with ULA's heritage, certifying a new launch vehicle is no easy feat. It is still rocket science after all. And even if the Vulcan's early flights go well, ULA's competition, many of whom are nimbler and more vertically integrated, will not be standing still. And with that, today's episode has come to its end. If you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. And as a quick note, if you have advertising needs, you can contact us directly via email. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time. Until then, thank you for watching, and have a good one.